uh, we, we are starting now. We are recording this meeting, so it will be recorded uh, so that it can be made available uh, tomorrow on our website. And I'll just ask everybody, um, except the presenter at this point, to mute their um, audio um, down on the left-hand corner outside your, your video button uh, so that, um, you know, we like to hear the dog. We like to see the dogs and cats and 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 family members, but maybe not necessarily hear them um, for this part of the meeting. Thanks. Okay. Should I should I just get started? If if you um, we're actually going to start with a sorry, Greg, was that you? That's me. I looked down for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, please, um, if if you could. Um, I wasn't sure if Tom was going to. Yeah, I'll, I'll start us off and then we'll turn it over to you, Greg. So okay. just to uh, bring the board uh, some information, we had talked about the international program and the impact COVID had on it and uh, our, what happened to our numbers in the first part of the year. And, and then I believe at the last board meeting, uh, when we were giving an enrollment update, we talked about how the numbers and the interest seemed to be growing a little bit for second semester. Along with that, obviously, comes the need to, uh, to find the homestays uh, with those students coming in. Now, a lot of this hinged on the fact that there was a change in the federal regulations around allowing international students to come back. And so I've asked Greg and Paul to talk a little bit about the status of our current international program, the current students we have, the ones that are coming in, and one of the things that's happened is lots of concern expressed, of course, after the announcement yesterday by a provincial health officer around the restrictions that, that we're living in. And as we were out actively seeking places for international students, there's some confusion as to why were we allowing this to occur. And so I just wanted some explanation for trustees and for everyone to really understand the the nature of it. Things haven't changed in terms of uh, our protocol. We're continuing to follow the guidelines. And so I'll ask Greg, if you can start us off, Greg, just giving us the, the numbers side of things and it, all, all things international, and then we'll turn it over to Paul to talk about the health and safety aspects. That sounds great. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Greg Kohanek, and I'm the district principal for the International Student Program. And as Tom's suggesting, I am sort of the keeper of all things international right now. It, I want to give you, I'm mindful of your schedule. I know you have a busy schedule tonight, but uh, we, um, I want to give you a little bit of background before I jump into the message that we sent out last night asking uh, Comox Valley families for uh, their assistance in helping us find homestays. But I'll give you a little context first. Um, at the beginning of this year, pre-COVID, we had reached our target of 200 FTE, which is sort of the, the number that we usually shoot for so that we're able to provide staffing to the schools in the Comox Valley and services and you know the, all the things that the, the, the programs of the Comox Valley have come to sort of you know, you know, enjoy as a result of having an international program, successful international program in the district. Uh, COVID hit and we were we went through a, a flurry of withdrawals and uh, refunding uh, people their money in April and May and very uncertain times regarding what September would look like. And though our target was met for September, by the time everything was settled and travel restrictions were imposed by the Canadian government, we end, ended up settling in at an FTE of 86.9. Uh, by the time September 1st hit. Our borders were closed and um, it looked like that's kind of where we we're, were going to settle. Now, that's kind of the background. Um, that's the numbers as we had them in September. Um, last night, now, uh, and I should say that the way, our, the way our program runs is that we market ourselves as a homestay-based program. That means that our international students, which we have uh, 118 of right now, presently in the Comox Valley, um, they stay with Comox Valley families and they become part of those families. And how we recruit families is that many of our families have been with us for 10 plus years. 
But every once in a while, we do need to go through um, recruiting drives to make sure that our, our numbers sort of stay where they are because our program really depends on it. Uh, usually in the neighborhood of four to six times a year, we will send out messages to all Comox Valley families, seeing if anybody's interested in becoming a homestay family. Now, last night we sent out uh, the same message that we send out, like I say, three or four times a year. Um, really not great timing in terms of Bonnie Hendry's announcement that kind of Christmas was canceled and uh, and there were certainly people on social media that really, um, you know, showed their anxiety, their anger, their, you know, being upset because what they did is they equated that, they equated that almost immediately with, well, what do you mean we're having international students in the, in the Comox Valley? It's, you know, that's like, we're not allowed to go and visit people and yet we're inviting these people in. So, um, on Monday, we had what has changed for us. The reason that we sent that message out on Monday is that as things are changing in the international world, um, the borders have been closed for several months. But what we're seeing is that those borders are opening and the Canadian government is granting study permits and study visas to students that they weren't previously doing. And what that means is that essentially they are granting travel exemptions. They are saying that those students uh, study experiences abroad are essential. So uh, I think what I need to do is clear up some of the misconceptions around, you know, sort of the fact that we do have international students in the Comox Valley presently. We have gotten through, we've quarantined 78 of them to this point in September. Uh, just things that I don't think a lot of people kind of know. And uh, if your constituents ask and you get asked questions, and if you haven't already, um, I, I really don't want anybody here to be taking, you know, the, the emails that you don't necessarily have all the details on. I would be more than happy to field those emails. Um, I've certainly, I've had about four or five today that were, you know, expressed concern that we were actually doing these things. But the more I was able to kind of uh, educate people as to what our, our program does and how we actually get people in our district, and what the rules of the day are, because we aren't medical professionals, of course, we are following uh, the, the guidelines laid down by the Provincial Health Authority and Immigration Canada. So we are doing what 41 other international programs in the province of BC are doing right now, following all the rules, making a robust safety plan uh, that, whose prime aim is to keep Comox Valley safe. Uh, we did that in conjunction with Dr. Charmaine Enns, the local health officer who's Bonnie Hendry's representative in the Comox Valley. She approved our plan, actually said our plan was uh, exceeded expectations of uh, the Quarantine Act, and uh, we thought we were good to go. Um, sending the message out last night, really what I spent most of my day doing today was just kind of educating people that uh, had those questions. Now, social media has a life of its own. I, I do understand that, and I respect the fact that people are you know, very upset about it. I'm upset that I can't see my mother and father during the Christmas holidays, but I think a lot of people are transposing that anxiety and that anger um, into the assumption that we were taking international students like tomorrow. Uh, and, you know, we're recruiting for, we're recruiting students for February and for April. And, uh, you know, that's essentially what, what we did. And um, I think that's basically it. Really what I wanted to do is uh, provide a forum for questions and answers. So if anybody out there had questions about this, um, we're trying to head this off at the pass and uh, certainly I wanna be your go-to person for information on this. So if anybody has any concerns, please ask those questions or by all means email me. Thank you, Greg. Paul, do you have anything to add to Greg's statements? You're muted, unfortunately. No, I'm not muted. Um, only, only to reinforce that our top priority in the school district is to is and remains the health and safety of our our students, uh, our host families, and the community. And the the safety plan that has been developed by um, Greg and his team. Uh, ha meets all of the requirements federally and all the requirements provincially has been uh, reviewed by Charmaine Enns and it's it's a very rigorous process uh, students uh, have to self-isolate in their home country 
uh, prior to their departure. They have to have been uh, tested prior to their departure, uh, arriving in Canada. Uh, once they arrive in Canada, uh, they will have medical checks and testing as well. And then they, they remain for another 14 days uh, in isolation in their homestay uh, prior to them uh, joining our community. So for all of those students and their families and the host families, uh, it is a rigorous process and it is, has borne out to be a very safe process as we've seen with the 78 students who have joined us earlier in the year. So I'm confident that everything is being done uh, that meets the federal and provincial standards and that uh, our international program is, is really leading the way in, in this area. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Greg. Trustee Wade, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you. Do any of the trustees have any questions for Greg? Oh, Sheila, it looked like you were moving towards your unmute there for a minute. <laughs> well, as is always the case, Michelle, um, as questions kind of come up, and if it's more of a heads up, if, if um, you do get these questions emailed to you or your constituents are asking, by all means, I'm, I'm happy to provide my, you know, my email address. Um, you know, I'm happy to answer those questions and uh, you shouldn't be wearing any of the negativity. I'm more than happy to to help educate, you know, exactly what we do and how we do it. Great, well, thanks very much. We, we really appreciate that. And we look forward to welcoming those students when they, when they come in the new year. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Th thanks very much, Greg. Um, I, I wanna add before we move on to our next um, um, item on our agenda is, is Sometimes it's, it's tricky to, well, we know who the trustees are, but not everybody knows. Um, and so I'm wondering if the trustees could either wave or unmute their video and light it up so that the yellow or the whatever color square you have um, lights up around you um, so that we are, sorry, I just muted myself. Um, so, now everybody, oh, now my Hollywood scores moved around. So, um, Trustee Frawley, do you want to wave or say hello? I did. <laughs> oh, did you? Okay. I missed it. As Sarah Jane, or Trustee Howe? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm moving around to get my hand in the way. Hi, everyone. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, uh, board Chair and uh, Trustee McDonald. Hi, everybody. And Trustee Hawksby. Hi. There you are. Great. Now I didn't miss anybody, did I? All right. Okay. Good. Alrighty. So um, next we are going. Um, Jeff Taylor is going to present to us, and um, a little bit of a preamble is the shifting landscape of public education. Sorry, the shifting landscape of public education considering the COVID nineteen pandemic has put a much greater emphasis on dis distance learning. Nides Navigate will share a presentation with us tonight that will give us a look at the challenges and the opportunities they faced during their significant enrollment gains this fall. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to try and give you, uh, tell a compelling tale of what we went through. It was certainly compelling for us. I hope you, uh, you're you interested in, in what I'm gonna share. Um, Alan says I don't talk much. I'm going to I'm going to change that right now. This is 39 slides long, so we'll see if we can if we can get through it. The first thing I want to uh, do is make sure that you're seeing my screen. Are you guys seeing my screen? Yes, that's a nod. Okay. Yes. Good. Um, let's just play it from the beginning here. Uh, I'm going to begin by talking about what we did uh, at the beginning of COVID, which is, for our purposes, right after spring break in March, April, May, and June. Uh, and it's important to know that at the outset, NIDES, I'm going to call it NIDES throughout this presentation, NIDES Navigator Interchangeable Terms, uh, 
when the district zigs, NIDES tends to zag. And this is a, another great case of that. Uh, I'm a little over the top in the image here, but you can, you can recall that in April and May, we had closed school suddenly and tried to service the needs of students at a distance. And that um, coming in June, we brought them back in uh, smaller cohort sizes and socially distanced. Almost the opposite happened at night. Uh, in April and May, we started to get really busy. We saw a lot of people sign up to be uh, to be part of us, and and um, it was an interesting time for us. It was uh, we had high morale at the time. We had lots of people um, coming that we'd never had before. Uh, we saw some other changes uh, that the students that we had were working harder than they had in the previously. We had better retention. We had better participation rates than we'd ever seen before. And we also saw more adults sign up for courses than we'd ever seen before. Um, that's not usually something our school is known for. We have our share of adults, but we tripled our adult enrollment in April and May. So um, June comes, we sort of resume, and this is a, this is a picture of our Faye classroom. And Faye is a good example of us still being in touch with what's going on in the rest of the district. Faye is a blended program, but it, it enrolls three days a week. So um, this program had to endure the same conditions and rules that other programs around the district did. So we, we were still in touch with that. But remember the vast majority of our students work at a distance. This brings me to the first of three parts for my presentation, which is uh, what we did on summer holiday, such as the holiday was. We, uh, we saw what had happened in April and May and saw the, the increased uh, interest in DL. So we said, we're going to probably have to have more staff. Uh, we're probably gonna be hiring some people. We should be making some space in our building wherever we can. So we, we looked at some efficiencies we could, we could achieve by closing down a meeting room, which was underutilized and making it an LST, um, LST space, so all, our, all our LSTs were worked there. And that freed up six other cubicles for us to hire other staff with. Um, we had a storage room. This is a picture of our storage room that we gutted and cleaned out and made uh, a usable space again. And we felt pretty good about ourselves for, for uh, predicting what was coming and being ready. We moved our, second, our secondary compass program from Glacier View to Solom because we were expecting expansion. Um, and we thought we were ahead of the game and how wrong we were. We knew that the ministry, we, we learned back in June that the, there was going to be a, uh, an announcement coming from the minister that was going to say what the next school year was going to start like. And we were expecting that announcement August 10th. That's what we were told it was coming out. But it came out early. And uh, that announcement changed everything for us. It's, it's where it started. We were looking for the genesis of all this. It was July 23rd. Our phone begins to ring and it just doesn't stop for the next 12 weeks. We have uh, parents from all over the province coming to us, but certainly the majority of those parents are coming to us from the lower mainland. Um, they're calling because they've expressed concern about COVID. They're, they're calling because they don't think their school is gonna do an adequate job of, of uh, cohorting. They're just highly agitated parents lots of them and uh, some of them are agitated because uh, they they're not getting the answers they're looking for in other places that they've called and um, I'm, this is my opportunity to give a shout out to our, our uh, front office staff our clerical staff because they were calm and empathetic and um, I got lots of feedback from those parents to say your your office staff is fabulous I felt listened to um, I felt like my problems were being addressed. I felt like I was, I was finally coming to a place where I could, I could have a, a working relationship with. So they were very good at that. But we were noticing the growth. It was significant. It had us worried. And I called everybody back from holidays on August 10th. When I say everybody, I mean the three vice principals that work at nights. And I said, we've got, we've got growth issues. Uh, we've tried to make space. We try to plan for growth. But this is bigger growth than we thought. 
uh, and we, over two hours, we hammered out a plan that we thought was pretty solid to address the growth we were, we were seeing. And as you see there, within two days, we threw that plan out because it was inadequate. Some good things came of this. Uh, we were watching social media and we have an advertising budget and we, we try hard to stay out in front of social media. But if you know something about DL, it attracts all kinds of parents and some parents, they're just not satisfied and they, they make it abundantly clear they're not satisfied. So we had some negative press in the past on some social media accounts, but over August, we could do no wrong. We, we had parent after parent speaking out favorably about us other parents jumping on board, other parents saying, how do I get in touch with them? And, and um, we just saw amazing growth as a result of that. But another thing we were hearing in social media, and this actually came from a former employee of SD71 was saying that the ministry is, is lying to you. The ministry is saying, if you don't like the COVID um, cohort model in, in the public school system, you can always go to DL, but DL is all full. And of course, Mary Lee stepped in and said, um, that's not true. We're not all full. NIDES is not full. And we had to change our website to say NIDES is not full. Um, but the ministry got wind of that. And the ministry contacted us, our personnel from the Ministry of Education contacted us in the third week of August. And they asked what I came to understand were these pat questions. The first one was, were we open? And uh, when, when we said yes, the person on the other end of the line was delighted. And she said, do whatever you can to stay open. The next thing she asked was, can we support French immersion? I said, we're great at French, but we, we're not great at immersion. And uh, I, I don't know how you get immersion in a DL environment anyway. She wasn't happy with that answer, but that's, that's the truth. Uh, we were asked if we could support students with special needs. And my answer of course was, it depends. It depends on where they're located. And we support many students with special needs in the Comox Valley and even in Nanaimo, but in, in places beyond that, it's really hard for us to do that. The last question I thought was the most telling. She asked, uh, would we be interested in supporting students outside of our own district? And I thought, you don't even know who you're talking to uh, because that's, that's our primary source of students is outside of the uh, Comox Valley. That was a bit disheartening for me to hear that question, but I came to understand she was asking a question of all DL schools around the province. She was canvassing to find out how many DL schools were open. And at the last week of August, Nides was the only school that was still open. All the other DL schools had closed. Um, and as a result, when we're the only game in town, we kept seeing our, our uh, enrollment growth really take off. It was, uh, it was hairy for us. It was, um, at, at first, it was you know exciting to be a part of a program that was growing this fast. That wore off quickly, and uh, we got, got to the place where we said these parents are desperate. Some of them are in tears when they're on the line because they've called four schools and all of them said no. We're going to be the school that says yes, and uh, and people broke down when they when they called us and said, "Oh, you're taking." I'm so relieved. I'm so happy and. Our office staff love that. They love to be the, the people that say yes. So that part um, really uh, did well for us. But our, our huge challenge, and it is a big challenge, was hiring teachers at the pace that we would need to hire to accommodate all that growth. And it was, it was super hard. We've had uh, experiences in the past where we, we had a qualified teacher that we had misgivings about. Uh, you know, just a nagging concern about an interview. We hired her anyway, and it didn't work out. And we, that's happened to us twice in the last two years. So we now feel like we, we're sure. Before we hire, we're sure. And uh, so we didn't just take any, any person off the street. We were diligent in our hiring practice, and we're very happy with our hiring practice because we've been happy with everybody we've got since. But um, it's one thing to say, oh, we're growing and, and be happy about it. It's quite another to... Uh, feel that the stress of knowing that it is a real struggle to get all those all those teachers on the ground. So we didn't. We we started the year and our in the DL world the school year starts at the beginning the first or rather the last Monday in August is when the, the DL calendar starts. So on that day we brought in everybody we had which amounted to 16 teachers and we put them through a two-day training program to help them 
do the job that we expected. The majority of those people were TOCs and uh, be, because we weren't in a place where we could hire yet. So uh, um, it was a successful thing, but it wasn't enough. We needed more people. And unfortunately, because they were TOCs, some of those TOCs worked for us for a week or two weeks, and then they got hired somewhere else, which was a real gut punch for us because we were always trying to get up one step ahead of, or at least caught up with our student enrollment, and we just couldn't seem to do it. It was, it was hairy, it was stressful. And by mid-September, we have all these students assigned to us that you know, school has started, they're with us. We don't have a teacher for them. Uh, we're, we're going as fast as we can but we don't have, have a teacher for them. So we assign work to them, like Marika and I uh, assign work to a, about 170 students, knowing that we don't have a teacher for them yet, but we will have a teacher for them. And we say to them, just do this work, separate it by week that you do it, but don't hand it in yet. We'll tell you when to hand it in. And that seemed to be a prudent way of handling it because we bought the time we needed to buy to keep those students and get those, those staff members hired. So we get to September 30th and we count our people and it's, it's alarming. We, we made projections back in August and I, I know there's a, people online here that heard me make those projections and they were all under, undershot the, the actual total. Uh, we were saying back in August, hey, we, we could have 900 extra kids here. Well, we didn't, we had 1300 extra students from the year before in various programs. So this graph that you see here, only shows K to nine DL, but it's alarming. K to nine DL is extraordinary. We had a total of 50 kids in this program last year, and now we have over a thousand. So it's just remarkable growth in one branch of what we do. After uh, probably during September, but over October, November, we start to see people leave us, and it's obviously a cause for concern, but. Uh, Part of it was they got fed up waiting for teachers we didn't have, or, or if we had to change a teacher because a teacher went somewhere else or got hired somewhere else. Um, but a lot of the people that we lost were local students, Comox Valley uh, residents that went back to their regular school. And we didn't take that, we didn't count that as a loss. We thought that was a good thing. Um, and an even better thing is over the same period of time, we collected students, we collected more students than we lost and the students we collected were from outside of the geographic area of the Comox Valley. So um, if you're looking at it from a district point of view, it was a win-win. Our DL students, students going back to the regular schools locally and those spaces that vacated were immediately being filled by students from the lower mainland and other parts of the province, which was, which was really good news. Uh, if I were gonna look now, we're, well, I'll, I'll cover it, but we're a little bit ahead where we were before. We're even bigger than we were back in September 30th, which is a good place to be. So I'll give you the quick rundown on our programs. And, and when we talk about NIDES, you're talking about several dis related but somewhat disparate programs. You got to look at it holistically. One of our programs is the Harvard Learning Communities. They, uh, they exist in 25 different sites around the province. That program had 440 students last year. It has 550 this year. And that's because we pegged 550 as our maximum growth um, based on our current staffing and uh, physical resources. We would need to find other spaces. We need to hire brand new teachers to get any bigger than 550 and we just couldn't do it. So we ended up turning away 80 students. Some of those students on the wait list for HLC signed up on our DL program instead. Um, this took longer, but it, it, it happened as we had predicted it would. The NIDES secondary program, these are kids taking secondary courses, almost exclusively grade 10, 11, and 12 courses, uh, has doubled in size from last year to this year. Twice as many, I wanna say kids are taking courses, but there's a lot of adults in there now too. So that program is, is just taken off. Uh, we, uh, it didn't take us by surprise, but we weren't in a place where we could, um, we could staff it up front. We had to staff it as, uh, as we went or behind, um, be a little bit behind the growth curve. So as a result, we had a lot of TOCs hired to, um, to backfill to make sure that uh, we could manage it. But this is important that uh, originally this was NIDES, the secondary program was 
nights and then other programs joined on but this was part of the core business and now it's doubled in size and we haven't seen that growth before we've seen growth but nothing like that um, we have our local brand of hlc is compass we have a compass program in courtney we have a compass program in Imo. we anticipated growth in both programs and we were not disappointed um, we added a, a teacher and a section uh, a classroom to each of those programs and uh, the other thing about Compass is that it was one of our programs that would fill mid-October or later, and it was filled from the first day of school. We have two programs in the province that uh, support students with autism. NUCO is one, it's in Nanaimo. It had struggled last year for its own reasons, its own internal reasons. It's having a way better year this year. Penticton Excel is also having a strong year. Um, their growth, uh, their enrollment has not changed that significantly from last year to this year, but it seems to be more solid this year. That brings me to the FAY program. The FAY program is the only one that's actually lost people. It hasn't lost a lot of people, but we've we've had some people from FAY say, three days is too many. I'm not comfortable being in school that often. Move me to Compass and uh, hold my spot. So we've done that. Uh, FAY is the one program that really um, is very similar to other school-based programs that you see around the district. And like other schools, um, COVID is cramping their style. There, there's a lot of performances. There's a lot of activities that they would like to be doing right now that they can't do as a result of COVID. Uh, nobody will be happier than the FAPE program when, when COVID is over. So I'm going to finish the updates, part two, with the K-9 DL program. Last year, it had one teacher, Marin Hills, one. And then, and she did looked after about 35 students and the remaining 15 students were parceled out to other uh, Compass teachers. And that was it. We had 50 students in that program. Now we have over a thousand students in that program and it continues to grow every day. We, we, we take enrollees every single day in that program. So that's, a, if you're a math person, that's a 2000% growth in one program, which is outrageous. So we wanna know, what does it mean? Where are we going? And I've heard people talk about this, and uh, this is my opportunity to editorialize a little bit. I know that's going to make some people uncomfortable, but, but it's important that we um, look at this from a perspective that isn't solely brick and mortar, because that's where we make mistakes when we make projections. So um, try and follow along with this part, and uh, hopefully you'll share my reasoning. Maybe not. You can challenge me on it later. We, as a school, rely on trend data to predict what's coming, not just trend data to staff the year, but trend data to say, when are we going to have a busy period versus when are we going to have a lull, and we plan for that. And our trend data has been, up until last year, solid and reliable. And you know, we can predict when we're going to have a slowdown in secondary, um, in, on our secondary program right down to the week based on trend data from past years. Trend data has gone out the window this year, as you, you can imagine. So now we're looking for new metrics to make our best guesses where things are going next year. I'm gonna share with you some of the things we're doing. You see 2000% growth in the DL program, you wonder that can't stick, that, that can't possibly last. What, do we, what is gonna happen next year? I can tell you that yes, it's true that a lot of people signed up for guides this year because of COVID. They were avoiding COVID, that's clear, that's obvious. What we're seeing now though, after they've been in the program for four months, is uh, the feedback we're getting from some parents indicates that some, some will stay no matter what the situation and some are gonna go no matter, and some should go because they're, they're clearly not cut out for DL. But um, we're, the case we're gonna try and make here is that is DL a stopgap for COVID or is it something more? And I'm gonna try and say that it's something more. So when we started in September, we had lots of feedback from parents. The feedback was positive. You can possibly chalk that up to a parent patting themselves on the back because they chose nights and they were happy with their choice. So it, September is too early to make that decision anyway. We're thinking a lot of parents are going to decide whether they want to stick with DL or move back to the regular system based on the first report. Uh, if their first report card is substantially better than what they were seeing before, they might say, this works for us, we're sticking. Or yeah, conversely, if it's a disaster, um, they'll say, we got to get out of this and get back to regular school as soon as it's safe to do so. 
say from their perspective. Um, we know that there we are nudging some parents along because we're not getting a lot of work out of their kid. And uh, those parents, are, some of them are pushing back at us and we can already feel that the relationship is tense and they're gonna go the first chance they can go. We, I, we can see that. And yet there's others that have said to us, this is so great, the stress is gone. It used to be such a hassle to get my kid to school and my kid loves this. We hear that as well. So because we're hearing all of this information, we're getting all this information from all these different sources, we're ready to make some kind of guesses on where we're at. I just wanna tell you that, I wanna suggest that if, if people believe that DL, distance learning is a pale imitation of the conventional classroom learning experience and that no child or parent would ever choose it unless they absolutely had to, this is wrong. And this is the wrong way to think. What's really going on here is that DL is a substantially different way of providing an education. And some people are choosing that different way. And that's why some of these people are gonna stick with us. Um, I'm not expecting a lot of K to nine people to choose that different way, although some of them will, but certainly a lot of secondary people um, have lived through the conventional system and they're ready to do something else. Even if it's only for one or two courses, they're definitely ready to do something else. We're, we're seeing that now, which is pretty much certain. Um, we have to ask ourselves, how many are gonna stick? And I'm gonna suggest to you, if we do a, a quick scan of what people have seen up to now. And uh, again, I'm asking you not to compare distance learning to conventional schooling. Distance learning is something different entirely. If you like what conventional schooling offers, you're going to, in other words, and from a student point of view, meeting with friends is, is paramount. It's, it's the big thing, um, the social time they have with friends. And then access to being on a team or in a club or something that they love, that is compelling. They want to go to school for those reasons. Sometimes they want to go to school because they believe they've received quality instruction, which is a good reason, or they need it for the credentials to go on to university. Certainly we hear those things. Um, students that come to DL often are more about, I want to be autonomous. I want to be in charge. I want to work at my pace. I want to work when I want to work. Um, those are the kinds of people we seem to attract. It's a different set, and, and they come to us for an entirely different set of reasons than conventional schooling. When we look at the conventional ideal again and look at what, what has happened under COVID, if you're the student that really enjoyed conventional schooling, um, your, your opinion of conventional schooling got battered a little bit this year because you didn't get to participate in those extracurriculars. Um, you didn't get to see all the friends you wanted under the conditions that you might have wanted. Um, you probably were subjected to a Copernican system, which might not have being in line with the courses you wanted to take when you wanted to take them. And I have, there are some students that have said they enjoy doing two courses a day for 10 weeks, but a lot of students have said they don't enjoy that. So what we're looking at this year then is a comparison of distance learning versus conventional learning under COVID. COVID's not having its best, I mean, conventional learning isn't having its best year under COVID. Distance learning is in its prime under these conditions. And so, suddenly DL doesn't look like such a bad option. Certainly not this year, next year it might. But if we're asking the question, how many people are gonna stick with DL after the year they've had with conventional or, or the year they're aware of with conventional schooling, I'm going to assert that we are not gonna lose all the people we just got. We're gonna lose a lot of the people we just got, but not all. And I'm, I'm throwing out the idea of 40%, that's not scientific, but I, I'm going to guess that that's fairly accurate. That when all is said and done, of the 1,300 people we lost, we're gonna be able to hang on to about 600 of them. This is um, a spreadsheet that comes from the Ministry of Education. It's the school contact list. It used to come out in a booklet form. Now it comes out as an Excel spreadsheet. I had to take that spreadsheet that they released and sort it um, in Excel. But if you look here, it shows North Island Distance Education School. I sorted it by enrollment. Um, we're the, uh, it looks like the second largest school in BC, the largest public school, only second to um, an independent school, Heritage Christian. But again, if you look closely at Heritage Christian, they have a homeschool registration of 612 kids. These homeschoolers, they don't have them. They're not really attached to that school. 
So if you take away that 612, North Island Distance Education School is the de facto largest school in the province. And I want you to know that because I don't think the ministry knows that. And I'm gonna explain why that's important. Um, one of the things, I, I, you, you probably think the biggest thing we're dealing with right now is all this growth and it is, but a, a very big thing on our agenda right now is that uh, two things are happening at the ministry level that affect all DL schools in the province. One is the learning management system that we're using is going up for an RFP review. Uh, and the upshot of that is that we might be told to go to a different learning management system. If, if the, the system that we use, which is called Canvas, doesn't win, then we will have to go to a different system, which we're not crazy about naturally. But that's not the big deal. The big deal is um, the province has said they're going to move to five provincial service providing schools to uh, be the only five schools that have the right to service students outside of the geographic confines of their own district. Now, that's what we do a lot of. So we are, we really want to be one of those five schools. And as you see what I've italicized here, we feel really confident that we will be one of the five schools selected, given that we're the oldest and the largest, but also that we were the only school that didn't close when everybody else did. So um, we've proved that we can be scalar as well. The, the problem is we want to make sure the ministry knows it. So I'm getting the word out to as many people as I can. And in your dealings with the ministry officials, uh, hopefully you'll let them know. Tom and I've had this discussion. Tom's on top of it. He's already talking to people in the ministry to make sure that they know. So uh, we're, we are the front runners by all, by all accounts, but this is the ball we have to make sure we get across the finish line. We, we have to get across the goal line with this one because it's important. Something you may know or may not know, but you should know, we've always had more out of district than in district students on our enrollment. But this year it's swung even further. Now fully three quarters of our student population is outside of the Comox Valley. So we really heavily rely on out of district students. Um, it's something I, I want you to be aware of. Uh, second to last slide. What are we gonna be doing this year with all these people? We're gonna to continue to build capacity around a K-9 deal program. And, and what that means is, um, while we were obsessing and stressing about uh, getting our staffing in place, we had lightning in a bottle, we didn't even know it. Uh, we didn't realize it right away. Whenever you uh, start a brand new school, you hire a bunch of new teachers all at the same time, not necessarily new teachers, but they're all new to the building at the same time. And you have this, um, situation where everybody is of the same status, everybody's starting from the same place. And it's very easy to get everybody to, to buy into a common mission because they're all in there, they're all in there together. And uh, we see that with our K-9 DL program. Uh, they're, they've bought in, they, they work together, they collaborate, they share, they're excited. They're uh, a highly motivated group. Um, we've had the HL teachers sort of do some mentor work with, mentorship work with them. And the, the, uh, the HLC teachers are saying, these are cool people, we like them. So uh, it's, we're enjoying that dynamic right now where it's feeling like we're starting off a brand new school because we've got a bunch of new staff all thinking the same way, wanting the same thing. Uh, so it's powerful. And if we, if we continue to harness it, uh, we'll make great things uh, happen this year from that. We have been entering into agreements on, on the HLC front because we want to buffer the the anticipated loss in enrollment that we're expecting at the DL side by expanding our HLC. We were, uh, we underestimated the amount of demand in HLC last year and had to cap it. This year, we're gonna try and see where it goes if we don't cap it. Uh, with the support involvement of staff, we're gonna manage our secondary program. We have to redo how we do our secondary program because it's becoming unwieldy and we're using TOC time more than we should be to, uh, to manage it. So, Here's more good news. Our secondary teachers have been super patient and have been right there with us and have, have been supporting the planning process. And we're learning if we involve our secondary teachers in what we can do, they work, uh, they work to make it work. And we're not butting heads with these people. They're active in finding the solution. So we're having a great relationship with our secondary teachers right now. And, and we're hoping when we transform our program to reflect this new growth and make it to use the expression, you make it more scalar or scalable. Um, 
they'll, they'll be part of that discussion. As a, as a side note, as an example, our English department has uh, focused on building relationships with kids as one of, one of their primary aims. And people wonder, why would you do that? Why, you know, you've only got them temporarily and they're at a distance, why would you do that? Well, here's the, the net effect of that. Allison, our vice principal told me yesterday or earlier today that uh, in English 12, we have uh, an activation rate or, or let's say a, a, a student activity rate of in the high 90s. That means if we, if we bring in 100 kids, 95 of them are actively involved in the course, which is comparable to a brick and mortar school, uh, which is almost unheard of in a DL environment. Usually, frequently in the old days, we would have 100 people sign up and then 50 people drop off the map almost right away. They'll depend on the first assignment and then nothing else. We've been a lot better since those early days, but this is the first time we've been knocking at 95%. So that, that's a huge improvement for us. So, and getting that many people through is, is a real feather in her cap too. It really speaks well to the DL program as a viable option. Uh, we're looking for trying to grow our secondary blended program as well. We have seven summits. We just started um, Canopy, which is uh, our support for HLC. It's a, our local name for HLC grade 10 and it'll go beyond. And, and we've got a new one in the hopper for uh, North Vancouver, West Vancouver next year. A, a secondary program. And finally, we're going to look at improving our blended programs with FAE, Compass, and Enter um, because uh, COVID is, has taken a toll on them and, and we have to revitalize those programs as soon as we get a chance to do that. My final slide is uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, I'll be happy to entertain questions if you have any. I had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, hi, Jeff. My name is Sherry. Mm -hmm. um, can you just reiterate about the ministry in the five schools? Was it the five schools that they want to designate solely for DL in the province? Is that what they're coming up to have a meeting about? Yeah, the, the initiative is to streamline and to um, standardize uh, what's being provided in the way of DL so that it's a, a quality control measure. And it's, I actually endorse it. I think it's a good idea because um, the, the quality of education you get varies dramatically from one DL school to another. And lastly, um, you had mentioned about the learning management system uh, possibly changing. Is that coming up in a meeting uh, soon, you said? There's a there's a, a committee tasked with creating the RFP for the RFP is supposed to be released in the end of February. They are supposed to be making a decision on it over March. So we'll have in here are the announcements by April, early April. Jeff, I want to um, I want to thank you for that presentation and. And I, um, I'm trying to figure out when, when you and your team sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you've been, you've been running this, this marathon like a sprint. We it, have. We and have, then was, looking to the future. We have to look to the future. Everything about what we do is about, is about reading the tea leaves. But um, at, at Tom's behest, I have given some time off to some of our VPs that they didn't get over the summer. So we're in better shape than we were. We're not as testy with each other. There was a, a while there that we were just, well, the stress was showing, but it's, it's a lot better now. It's a lot smoother. Yeah, that's a huge amount of information. I'm super pleased that we've recorded this and we'll be able to point people to the presentation um, for later on. Now, Sheila, I see that you're unmuted. Um, yes. You have something to share. Well, I, you know, I always have a, I always have a question, at least one, um, and I can think. That, so, so first question, um, thinking about that ministry uh, approval of five DL offering districts, um, and uh, and yeah, it seems to me that we're we're so far ahead. Uh, um, it is so lucky for this province that some of the school districts were. Uh, 
were already taking a lot of students from outside their own districts because some districts have no DL programs at all. So um, that really would have been something that saved uh, the ministry from a great deal of, of trouble. The fact that we were up already and, and very flexible and able to accommodate. So, you know, good for you. On behalf of the ministry, I'd like to really thank you for being ready to, uh, to absorb so many people. Um, are, are, is, that, is that plan also going to have any possibility of expanding the number of districts that are allowed to do international DL? It, there's some questions on that. There was two pages of questions. One line in that in the two pages of questions that are being put forward was a question about whether somebody other than Cool School was going to be allowed to do that. But Sheila, to your earlier point, um, last year, Nides was the largest DL school, but eBus was the second largest, and and uh, Sides or VLN was the third largest. There was a, a significant jockeying. Um, this year over COVID and for EBUS dropped in prominence and, I, and it might cost them being one of the PSPs as a result. So part of why we did this was we wanted to make sure that uh, we were positioning ourselves as best as we could to make sure that it, was, it would be really hard not to pick us as a PSP. And yeah. by staying open and by retaining our position as the largest DL school in the province, I think we've we've accomplished that. It's going to be really hard for the province not to pick us. I just want to add the uh, the ministry. This is all part of their funding review. They haven't made any official announcement that a decision is coming down. Of course, now would not be the appropriate time. I don't think. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, a lot of what you're hearing is speculation. Um, nothing concrete yet. As far as the international goes, it's something we've been fighting with the ministry back to Jeff Stewart's days when Cool first mm -hmm. picked yeah. up the international mm -hmm. DL. Um, and this year they awarded, if you recall, they awarded the international um, DL so that we could provide our international students with DL courses, but we had to go through Cool to do that. Yeah. And complained bitterly and I had quite a few conversations with folks at the ministry. So they're looking at that. Um, it's a big package and I think they're really looking at uh, the whole delivery of, of DL across the province. And as Jeff's pointed out, his willingness to stay open throughout this whole thing. And, and as you pointed out, Trustee Wade, not get any sleep. Uh, it's definitely been noticed in, in Victoria and I know that they, I personally had a call from the deputy minister thanking us for continuing to be open uh, during those tough times. Well, I really think that I, you know, I know that our district, I'm, I've been really proud with the qual, the issue about quality in our international program too, that it's been reviewed so many times to make sure that the experience that the students are having is always good, that there's lots of supports in all ways. And in nights, well, my daughter was, uh, you know, we were doing this when she was in grade six, and it was really a time when it was still a transition from a full on correspondence uh, a program where you got your box of paper and you mailed it back to the technology. And the first thing that was so clear was that students were assigned a teacher who was with them and was reaching out and connecting. And it was not just a matter of of mailing it into a marker. There's always been relationships and it's always been a lot of attention that the program uh, so supportive. And, and, and then it went from being, you know, strictly uh, individual to starting E-class where we were bringing students together to spend time together and in person with their teacher and have the benefit of that. So we're always looking at the ways we're meeting their needs um, and I, I think it, it just is just such a good testament to how you do your job, Jeff, and, and what you're building on. And, and uh, I'm, I'm always so excited and proud of how it goes. So my next question are the, the two things that I'm really interested in is, is one, how you think we integrate more uh, seamlessly into the bricks and mortar schools. So I'm you know, really see how beneficial the blended models that we see on Hornby or in the Fay program and stuff, they're great for, 
for those kids and I think they'd be great for more kids in uh, in within existing schools or associated and our high schools in particular to have more of that. And the other thing is, are you looking at piloting any kind of a program that brings a, a lens of uh, environment and nature in the same way that Fay brings the art and um, and uh, Enter brings the technology because I know lots of parents who are similarly interested in nature kindergarten and that that stream. So I'm thinking those are two other ways that you could be putting your attention when you are have all those free moments now. Well, let me answer that uh, with regard to the nature programming. Most of our HLCs are thematic. Some of them are based around STEM or other uh, other educational options, but we, probably a half a dozen of our HLCs are about outdoor ed, about mm -hmm. uh, nature. So um, we've got a, a long history, a long track record of that, actually. Uh, with regard to what works at the secondary and, and, and how do we get better integration and better service, um, that is a, a key thing for us. We're, we're trying to rebrand or, or reposition ourselves amongst high schools around the province as a partner and a support to what they do. So there's lots of schools that, for example, can't run Calculus 12 because they don't have the critical mass. Now they can consider it an option. They can put it in their course catalog because they know they can send it to us. We have lots of schools that undersubscribe, uh, they undercreate courses for English 12 and they're in uh, semester one, a lot of grade 12s seem to drop out over, or they graduate early, or they take no credit. So you, you, there's a, you're often rewarded when you underbuild in grade 12. But if you get caught and you have knives in your back pocket, it's not a calamity. You don't have people breathing down your neck. Where's my physics 12? I was promised physics 12. Um, with regard to the model, we discovered the best model right here in this in this uh, district. Um, ILCs, where students go to a room with, within the regular class and within the regular school to do night's work, greatly increases their success rate. And we've seen other schools, for example, Shadalek on the on um, Seashell Peninsula is a school that runs an ILC very similar to what we run. They put all the kids that are signed up for night's courses in that room with the teacher, and Shadalek hits it out of the park. They're, those kids do well. Uh, we've got other schools that do it. LV Rogers has looked at doing it. LV Rogers is in the same district as Cool School, but they send all their kids to Nice. Isn't it? No? Well, they have a DL school at LV Rogers or in, in their neighborhood. Yeah. But there's... LV Rogers is in Nelson. Cool is yeah. in Kamloops. Right. Okay. So Cool is closer to them, but they still choose us. So yeah, generally speaking, the best model, the most successful model in a DL environment is if you get the kids to go to a classroom where there's a teacher there to take attendance and, and to liaise with our teacher, they do well. We've got another a group of kids in uh, grades four to nine, in four to 10 actually, in Kelowna that are, they have, the parents have got together, they've hired a TA. Uh, we work with that TA, but the, the coursework is coming from our school. And those kids are meeting with better than usual success because of the additional layer of support. So I've got a question in the chat and I'm gonna see if I get it right. It says, we love we love knives, but not canvas. How come you don't use Noodle? We use Moodle. We left Moodle, to D, went to D2L. We left D2L to go to Canvas. Um, Moodle is, I'm going to give you my opinion. It's a dramatically inferior product to Canvas. Canvas is way more powerful. Canvas allows us to do, build way more engaging courses. When you, when you take a course from Moodle and you transpose it into Canvas, you have to pretty it up. You have to add things. When you take a course from Canvas and put it into Moodle, you've broken it because Moodle can't do all the things that Canvas can do. Okay. Thank you. I hope that was the answer that the person who put in the, the chat was looking for. Um, I have a question, um, as I don't see any other hands raised right now. The All of the, the teaching staff that are working um, through NIDES to support the 
2,000 plus or whatever the number was, was it 4,512? Um, yeah, that's, sorry, that's a misleading number. It, if okay. you measure schools by FTE, we're at about 2,150. Okay. Um, are they, um, are they working out of, are they all working out of, or primarily out of their homes? Are there, are there work spaces for them um, at our bricks and mortar site? How, how does that work? The majority of them are at a work site. Some are at Solom, some are at Vandier, some are at Glacier View. Our HLCs, of course, are working out of sites around the province. So it's only this recent growth of the, the K-9 DL program where we don't have space for them. So a number of those have chosen to work in the building because um, they're brand new and they want to engage with colleagues. And to make space for them, we've taken our existing and experienced teachers like Faye and Compass and ask them to go home to make that to make that space. Okay. It's one of those challenges. And are there any more questions or comments? Sarah Jane? Um, yeah, I just wanted to mirror the thank yous for a really detailed presentation. Um, I had like probably eight questions here that I had been, that I'm most like prepared to ask and they were all answered. I'm really glad that this is being recorded right now because I think so many parents have so many questions about what your program is, what you're doing, um, how you're supporting students. Um, and you were very honest about uh, like the challenges that you had and the negatives and the positives about it. So I appreciate uh, you just being so thorough with everybody. And I feel like I just went on a DL journey with you. <laughs> so thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Sergey. Now, Sherry, did you have your hand up? Okay. I did. I just wanted to say thank you as well. We've been um, DL with you guys for, uh, we're into our sixth year. And we normally travel by sailboat and we are now back in Canada because of the virus, but the program is awesome. And um, some of the new students that have come on board spoke to me and I gave them information. And so they are part of the new students. And so I just, it's an excellent program and I really, love it and I love the teachers and all of the support so I just wanted to say thank you as a parent um yeah all right thank you great that's great um looking um so I have another question if nobody else does do you do you have the sense of how many students are doing all of their um education this year through through our program and versus how many are just doing some like some of their courses? Yeah, it, um, when we're talking about HLC students, of which there's 550, they're all doing their program with us. If you're talking about K-9 DL, they're doing all of their program with us. That's another thousand. Um, if they're Compass uh, programs, they're, they're about 90 in our Compass, about 85 in the Nanaimo Compass. They're all with us. Phase, of course, all with us. We have schools at Seven Summits. Um, they're mostly with us, but they sometimes take courses with other schools. Uh, Penticton Excel, NUCO, all with us. So when, you, when you're asking who's across enrolled, you're really looking at um, grade eight, nine uh, students. There's aren't, there are not many, but there are a few cross enrolled students at grade eight, nine level. We do that as a service. We make almost no uh, profit on that. In fact, we lose money when we support grade eight, nine cross enrolled. And the 10, 11, and 12 cross enrolled, which is significant. Uh, we have lots of kids in grade 10, 11, and 12 that take one or two courses with us. Um, and the bulk of their uh, learning regimen is at their home school. What we are finding is that if somebody takes a course with us in grade 10, we're almost definitely going to see them again in grade 11 and in grade 12. Okay, great. Th thank you for that. Does anybody else have any comments or um, questions? It's always surprising when uh, Mr. Douglas is quiet. <laughs> oh, there we go. I got him to take his mute off. 
There well, we I just wanted to say that I've known Jeff for a real long time, Jeff, and you didn't disappoint. You gave us <laughs> lots of information tonight, and um, it was really, really well done. Thank you very much, and thank, thank you, you for all the work that you and the staff have done at NIDES. You've been a great service to the parents and the students in our valley and around our province. So good job. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, but I'm getting too much credit here. The, the reason why we were able to pull this off is it, we had clerical staff that were behind it, and largely because we have someone like Marika who has been at NIDES forever and knows it inside out and has done a lot of the work there. Allison Cavallinas spent two months straight being an HR person and she just busted a gut doing that. And of course, as I said, under COVID, the programs that suffer most for us are the blended programs and Dwayne has been working hard to keep those maintained. I, I, you know, I was the person that said, we're gonna do this, but then other people did. So I don't, I don't feel comfortable taking too much credit for that. Okay, well, you can always share my comments with them then and I will. let them know that we really appreciated this. And this was really helpful, I think, for all of us, especially the trustees, to be able to, um, if we have opportunities to connect with um, folks connected to the Ministry of Education, to point them to our program, to point them to, the, to what we've achieved and how we supported the students all across British Columbia. Yeah, this was, mm -hmm. it certainly wasn't what you planned as a marketing strategy, but um, it's certainly shown how, how our program can, can step up and, and um, take on any challenge and do it well. All right, thank you. Uh, Jeff Manning, did you have anything that you wanted to add? I, I just wanted to say, I know Michelle, you were hoping maybe to have a conversation around the future of our education committee meeting. So I thought maybe now would be a good time to stop the recording. Uh, okay. We can have that conversation uh, as a committee and those people that want to stick around for that certainly may do so. But if you want to leave or you've gotten the, the information part of the meeting out, uh, you're welcome to leave. Okay, and I just want to thank everybody who took the time either live or through the recording um, to, watch tonight, to watch the um, presentations tonight uh, through our education committee. Thank you all.